So hello everyone and welcome back. We are now in week 15. This is it, the final stretch coming down to the wire for Math 140 SCI. And we are going to hopefully finish what you need to know for the final today. I believe, please remind me if I'm wrong, but last time we did chapter six, correct? On two-way tables, is that correct? Or do we not do that yet? No, we did yeah, chapter we did. six. We did chapter six. And but then we went we ahead and did we start chapter 25 or no? No. Wonderful. Okay. So now I know what to do today. So let me join on here and we will get started. Are there any questions on what we did last time? Uh, professor? Yes. Usually we get a week to do the homework, but chapter 25, I believe, is due tomorrow. Is that going to be extended? Yeah, I will. I, as soon as I can get on, because I can't right now until it sends me my password. But in, uh, once I get on, I will extend that. Apparently, um, it's been. Uh, oh, that's not it. The the all the all the deadlines are set by uh, my supervisor long before the semester started. So apparently he wanted me to be maybe a little bit ahead of where I am now, so that we're not teaching it in the last week, but rather reviewing. We're one day behind, I guess. But yeah, I will I will push that off. Uh, okay, so chapter twenty five on two categorical variables. Two categorical variables, the chi-squared test. The chi-squared test. And the symbol for the chi-squared kind of looks like that. It's like an X, but it's not an X because it's a Greek letter. It's the chi-squared test. And the chi-squared test, there are essentially two different tests and we're going to do both of them. Uh, if we can go over the conditional formatting again, Flower, what do you mean conditional formatting? Do you mean that um, the stuff last time with the uh, two-way tables? Yeah, we're, everything we do today is going to be based upon that. So by doing today's stuff, we will inherently go over that stuff as well. OK, and um, yeah, we'll do that right now. Uh, Professor, you're probably going to go over this, um, yeah. but as a preview or whatever, is the joint and conditional the same or is it different? Because it was a little bit confusing. The whole no, there's, there's three time, things. But... So I'll, I'll take a minute then. The joint distribution is, okay, for each pair X, Y, what is the likelihood of having, of having that outcome? So the entire table, all the cells together is all needed for the joint distribution because every outcome, tell me the X and tell me the Y, and I'll tell you the probability. I need to know X and Y, and I can pinpoint the cell that we're talking about. For the marginal distribution, I look at the margins only. So I look at only the total X values or only the total Y values, and I don't care at all about the things that appear inside the table. The conditional distribution is I let you know which row or column I'm referring to for the entirety of the problem. And for the entirety of that problem, I don't care about any other row or column, just the one that I'm talking about. I don't care about anything but that row or column. And I wanna know the likelihood of every possible outcome. And I only compute the numbers for that row or column. So if I have something like this, a very simple one, one, two, three, four, five, or six, Here's my first X, my second Y, my, my first X, my first second X, my first Y, my second Y, and my third Y. If I say what's the probability of getting X1 and Y2, that would be five over the total, which is uh, 21. The probability of X1, Y2, oh, sorry, it's two over 21. Because out of the 21 possibilities, two of them, give me X1 and Y2. If I say, what's the probability of X1? Well, if I want X1, I don't care about those numbers. I just care about the total X1 and it's six over 21. Nothing else matters, just the total. 
Now, if I say what's the probability of x1 given y2, then I only care about the y2 column in which there are seven. And of those seven, two of them give me what I'm looking for. So the probability of x1 and y2 is two over 21. The probability of x1 is six over 21. And the probability of x1 given that I know it's y2 is two over seven. This is a conditional, this is the marginal, and this one is here's the joints. Does that make sense? Yes. Hopefully, flower, makes sense? Yes, okay. So the chi-squared tests, the first one we're gonna do to, to do them in the order that the book does them is going to be the test for independence. The chi-squared test for independence. The null hypothesis will always be the variables, whatever they happen to be for this example, the variables are independent versus the alternative, the variables aren't independent. There will be no exceptions to this when it comes to tests for independence. The null hypothesis will always be they are independent and the alternative will always be they are not independent. And our goal is going to be to determine based upon our data whether we reject or whether we do not reject, reject the null hypothesis, like it's been up until now for all of our other tests. So the easiest way to demonstrate this is with an example where you can see me walk through the process. So I have the following chart. This is on page 561. We'll just use this example. I have the following chart where we have the following data. Uh, conservative, moderate, and liberal are my political ideologies. And a have, a have not, a neither, and a refuse to answer. So American adults by political ideology and whether they consider themselves a have or have not um, 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 lifestyle, I guess. You know, am I one of the haves or am I one of the have nots? You have um, four rows. The number of rows is equal to four. The number of columns is equal columns is equal to three. And as such, the first thing we need to calculate is the number of degrees of freedom. We have had degrees of freedom before for tests, statistics, for t-tests and stuff like with the t. So now we have the degrees of freedom in this case. The formula is the number of rows minus one, the number of columns minus one. In our case, it's three times two. This is an example of six degrees of freedom. When we use our calculator to compute this in just a few minutes, we're gonna see that it gives us an answer of six for degrees of freedom. Um, we need now the data. And so here is the actual data. And I'm gonna put the values in the top left corner of each box, not just in the middle, because as we're gonna see in a second, we are gonna to have to compute other values. And I'm gonna to wanna to write those numbers down in the bottom right corner because we're gonna compare the actual data to what we expect to get if in fact the variables are independent, like the null hypothesis is claiming. So the null hypothesis is claiming that these two variables are independent. And someone says, you know, I don't think that's the case. I really have the feeling, I really have the feeling that depending on whether you are a have or have not, or at least whether you consider yourself a have or have not, that might um, be associated with your political, political ideology. Does anyone think that that might be the situation? Have or have not might be associated with your political ideology? Well, whether you do or that you don't, that's our test. 
The null hypothesis claims that they are not associated. The alternative claims that they are associated. And we would like to determine if they are or they are not. So here's the first thing I want you to do. Take out your calculator. You will need your calculator for this. This is not something that you want to do by hand. Trust me. Do we all have our TI-84 calculators? Okay. So hit second. And then in the fourth, in the, sorry, in the first column of your calculator, you should see the word matrix. I think it's the fourth button beneath the Y equals. So the fifth button in the calculator matrix. And you should see something that looks like this. Second matrix. Do you see that? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay. Then you're going to go to the right to edit. And you are going to edit matrix A. And you're going to make it a four by three matrix. So for matrix A in the top, you're going to put those two numbers as four by three. Matrix A is four by three. And you are going to fill in the matrix. What numbers are you going to put in there? The numbers that are on the that's exactly yeah. it the numbers that are in the table i just did it and that's what mine looks like you can see with mine the numbers match the match the data Do we all agree with that? Let me know when you're when you're ready to move on. And professor? Yes. Um how how did you do it again? You went to second matrix and then second matrix, and then I went over to edit because uh -huh. I want to edit my first matrix A. So I clicked edit. And then I clicked enter for matrix A and I told it to do a four by three matrix. Did you press enter when you did A or how did you? Yeah, yeah, I did enter. Yeah, enter when I did A. Okay. And oh, okay. Four and by. Then I made it a four by three matrix. And then I said, hey, let's put in my data. And we did it all individually, the numbers? Everyone, you did it individually. Okay, thank you. Now, these are the actual observations. But if the data was truly independent, then I would have gotten very specific values for each of the 12 cells. And without going into the details of why these formulas work, I'm just going to tell you what the formula is. So let's compute the expected count for the first cell. Go to the far right of the first cell to the margin. What do you get? What number's in the far right? I wrote it there. Uh, well, 248. No, no, no. Not in the date, not in the uh, table, in the margin. 1062. Now go to the far bottom. What's the margin beneath the cell that we're looking at? Uh, no, no, no. Again, we're looking for this cell right here. The number underneath it is 725, the margin beneath it, and the margin to the right is 1062. Do you agree with that? Um, mine doesn't show anything underneath. No, no, this, this, is, on, this is not in your matrix. This is in, oh. on, on the power, the, the iPad. Okay, in, the, in my work, you have to the right, of the cell that we're looking at is 1062 in the margin and directly beneath it in the margin is 725. I would like you to multiply those numbers and then divide by the overall total. What do you get when you multiply those two numbers and divide by the overall total? Um, I got 412.39. Okay, so 412.4, approximately. 
Now, don't write everything out, but just to make sure that you know that what you're doing is working, pick any other cell and let's just pick one at random. Someone give me a cell at random. Pick one of those 12 numbers at random. 21. 21, okay, so we're in the third row, third column. Tell me what the expected count for that cell should be. I just computed it, so tell me what it should be. 513. Uh, no, that's not what I got, but doing exactly the same math I just did. Oh, wait, sorry. Twenty-five point six. Twenty-five point five five is good too. In fact, how do you find it? You take the number in the margin of that cell. So in this case, that would be ninety-three and five thirteen. You multiply those and then divide by the overall total. So ninety-three times five thirteen. Oh, I hate when I hit that one by accident. 93 times 513, you divide that by the overall total, and that gives you that one. But we're not going to do it for all 12. That's a lot of work. So here's what I want you to do. Hit second again. Hit matrix. Hit edit again. But this time, we're going to edit matrix B. So rather than using matrix A, which we've already put in as our observations, I would like you to go and measure uh, or an input matrix B. What size should matrix B be? Uh -huh. What are the dimensions of matrix B? Same as matrix A, make it a four by three matrix. Four by three, excellent. And here's what I want you to do for the upper cell. I don't want you to put in 412.4 because 412.4 is an approximation. I would like you to type in as follows. 1062 times 725 divided by 1867, enter. And when you do that, tell me what does the matrix show in that entry? It says 412.4, it gives you the math, it doesn't, and it doesn't round. It might write 412.4, but it actually does the entire number. I would like you quickly, and I mean in a minute, let's do this quickly, do all 12 cells. What was it that we had to put in again? Um, 1062, 1062 times 725 divided by 1867. The marginal numbers multiplied together, divided by the overall total. The same thing we did just a few minutes ago by hand. And I would like you to do this for all 12 cells. And then I just finished mine. You can compare it to mine over here when you're done. Make sure you get the same thing I do. Do you guys get it?
Um, well, I don't know how you did it so fast, but it's taking me a long time. No problem. I will put them into the on the screen. The more you do, the faster you get at you know manipulations. But it is important to be able to do this correctly. For the second row, second column number, let's see, did I do it wrong? 660, 660 times 628 divided by 1867. Yeah, I'm not sure where that number came from. Ooh, I better check my matrix. Yeah, actually it's 222 on the dot. Thank you guys for correcting my work. Are the other ones good? Um, on mine for the uh, third row, third column. For first, first row, third column? No, third row and first column. So the 25, the, the one that I have 25.6? No, wait, hold on, columns are going this way? Right. These are columns. Oh, right. Sorry. First row, third column. So I got first, wait, wait. So first row. Yes. Third. So the one where I have 291.8. Yes. Okay, one second. Hold on. 1062 times 513 divided by 1867. I get 291.8. Mine rounds to 291.24. Check your math. Just make sure you input it correctly. 17.5, the one next to that down here. Let me do it again. 52 times 513 divided by 1687. I get I get uh, 15.8. Your calculator, your calculator will keep all the decimals. So whatever I put down, those are just approximations. Your calculator has an exact. What you put on the page doesn't really matter because your calculator has the exact values. I just wrote down what I had so that you know whether or not you're in the right ballpark or not. So Leanne, did, it, did you fix it? Was it, did you type it in incorrectly? I was continuing the rest before I went back. So let me do it right now. I'm sorry? I was finishing the rest of my column before I went oh. back. So let me do it right now. Okay. I'm going to write, so while you're finishing it, I'm just going to write some stuff down. Okay, it fixed it. Okay. So your chi-squared value for this test, your test statistic, just like we had a Z statistic and a T statistic for our other tests. So your test statistic for this situation is the sum of your observed minus your expected squared divided by your expected. So for example, 460 is what I observed. 412.4 is what I expect. So you subtract them, you square it, you divide by 412.4. You do it for each one of them, you add them all together, and that's how you get your chi-squared, your test statistic. I don't want to do it by hand. So here's what we're going to do. Hopefully you're all caught up now. Getting last row, I'm still getting, which one? For the last one? Hold on, hold on. I put it in wrong. I did, I did um, 18, 1687 instead of 1687. So that's my two mistakes. Already two mistakes for the day. This is a, a red letter day in the history of science. 
Thank you, Jason. It should be 14.2 or 14 point, the last one should be 14.2. So here's how you compute it. Hit stat, go to tests. And which test do you think we're gonna use? Scroll down to the one you think is the right one. Stat tests, and then scroll down till you think we hit the right one. It's the chi-square. And I want you to calculate. What is the what is our chi square? It's not C C. No, chi square, chi square. So what is our test statistic for this example? What does our calculator give us for our test statistic? And the chi squared tests. It gives us three pieces of information. It gives you the chi squared, it gives you the p-value, and it gives you the degrees of freedom. So what does it say for the chi squared? It gives us about 74.4. And it gives us a p-value of approximately zero. All right, this is what you should see. Chi-square 74.3. Oh, did I write four? No, 74, yeah, 74.4. P-value with approximately zero, send to the negative 14, that's essentially zero. And degrees of freedom is uh, six. Now, the p-value being zero tells me to do what? What's my conclusion going to be? Reject the null hypothesis. We reject the null hypothesis. What do we put for the observed? It should already be there. Observed should be matrix A and expected should be matrix B. You don't have to do anything. It should be A and B automatically. When I did, mine looks like this. It should look like this. Observed is matrix A, expected is matrix B. Okay. Now, if we think about this for a second, if I got values that are close to what I expect, then my numerator should be very small. My observed and my expected should be very close together. And therefore my chi-squared value should be low, right? Low chi-squared values make me inclined to not reject the null hypothesis. Big chi-squared values make me wanna reject it. The chi-squared looks like this. This is the shape of the chi-squared. So, it's, this is the critical region. Big, big values, big chi-squared values make me want to reject the null hypothesis. How big? Well, it certainly depends on the number of degrees of freedom, but it's certainly bigger values make me want to reject the null hypothesis and smaller values make me not want to reject the null hypothesis. In terms of knowing what the cutoff is, What's the cutoff point? What's the critical value? So of course, as always, you need your level of significance. Let's assume 5% because we weren't told otherwise. So how do I determine the critical value, the 5% cutoff? What I do is I go to a chi-squared table and I determine my degrees of freedom. In this case, my degrees of freedom is six. So I go to the sixth row and I want 5% to the right. So which, what is my critical value? If I want 5% level of significance with six degrees of freedom, what would my cutoff value be? According to this chi-squared table. Yeah, 12.6, 12.592. So my critical value is 12.592. And any chi-squared value past that makes me, um, makes me um, reject the null hypothesis. This is your first basic chi-squared test. It's a test for independence.
Can we have that link for that table? Uh, yeah, I just did a Google search for, uh, I just did a Google search for, uh, um, I'll, I'll go back, I'll show you what I did. I put in chi-squared table. That was my that was my Google link. And then I went to images and I just picked one at random. So there's nothing special about that one. It's just, I just put in chi-squared table. Sound good? Okay. So now we have the second type of test for uh, chi-squares. And this is the goodness of fit test. The goodness of fit test. If you go to stat and you go to tests, there were actually two chi-squared tests on your calculator. What was the other chi-squared test listed besides just the chi-squared test? The goodness of fit test, the GOF test. The, GO, the, the goodness of fit test is done in a different way than the uh, test for independence. The test for independence is a two row, a two way table test. The goodness of fit test is a completely different test, but it also uses um, the chi square. So let's do an example to illustrate it. But before we do, Again, I didn't go into the theory of why the previous test worked, but are there any questions for how to actually do it? If I gave you a, an independence question, are there any questions on your end and how to go about determining whether or not they're independent or not using the chi-squared independence test? Anyone have a questions for that one? Okay, so now we have the goodness of fit test. So here's an example. <clears throat> we have some data here. The data is there's seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh oh. Seven. There are seven pieces of data. Here are the numbers 84, 110, 124. Can we repeat it briefly like a quick overview? Yeah, Louise, give me a second. I'm just going to fin finish this. 104, 94, uh, wait, 84, 110, 124, 104, 94, 112, one, two, three, four, four. Okay, well, I'm stupid because I had seven all along. Okay. So <clears throat> so just to remind you of the chi-square test. So first, what is the chi-square test? It's a test for independence. It's a test for whether or not two variables have a connection or not. Because it's two variables, you have your two-way table, you have all your data. And we want to determine if they're independent. The way we do that is by first determining how many we expect to have in each cell if they truly were independent. And we do that by multiplying the two numbers in the margin for that cell divided by the overall total. That gives us those numbers in red. We then compute our chi-squared statistic, which your calculator does for you. And the formula is down below on the bottom of the, of, the, of the sheet right now, but essentially it gives you a value. It gives you a single number. And that single number, that summary of all the information is to then be used to determine whether you reject or not reject the null hypothesis. And what do you do? You determine one of two things. Is it past the critical point? Is it past the cutoff value? which you get from tables, or you can compute the p-value and see if that's less than your significance level. Either way, you, you conclude that you have a very rare result, an unusual result, and as such, because of the unusual results, you reject the null hypothesis. That is the test for independence. The goodness of fit test is a different situation. What we have here, are the number of births on every day of the week from Sunday through Saturday for a particular, uh, let's see, is it, um, doesn't say whether it's one hospital or many hospitals. It just says local records. There's a total 
of 700 births that were recorded. And those 700 births, these are the days that people were born. Now, if birthdays or the day that you were born during the week um, had no association with any, let me rephrase that, I'll try that again. Is there any reason why some days of the week people would be more inclined to give birth than others? Is there an aversion to giving birth on Wednesdays that people internally can control their birth factors, whatever they are, and, and, and not allowing births on Wednesday? I mean, is there, as far as I know, and I'm not an expert in this by any stretch of the imagination, but as far as I know, it just the birth happens when the birth happens. Right, there is no uh, uh, control, and therefore, if you think about it, it should be the same every day of the week. There should be a hundred birthdays every day of the week. So we have our observed, and my expected should be a hundred each time. If it's truly uniform. Okay, if it's truly a uniform distribution, recall what a uniform distribution is, by the way. A uniform distribution is when you have the same likelihood every day, every for every event, for every outcome. So what we're doing here is we're taking our data and asking whether or not our data fits a certain model. In this case, does the data fits a uniform distribution model. How good is the fit? Now, if I can rename this from a goodness of fit, fit test, what's another, what's a better thing to call it besides goodness of fit? What will be a better um, better name than goodness of fit. Any grammatically correct speakers here? No one speaks English good. Best fit, maybe. I was going to say a wellness of fit test. Yeah, I think it's a wellness of fit test. How well does it fit the data? I think would have been a more historically accurate name, but nevertheless, the name has stuck. It is a goodness of fit test. And we are going to determine whether or not the data fits a specific model. In this case, the uniform distribution, which means everything should be equally likely. And therefore, if there's 700 births, there should be 100 each day. How do we perform a goodness of fit test? Well. We're gonna put the data in our calculator, but this is a different scenario because we don't have a two-way table here. We just have one row. So here's what we do, go to stat, edit. And in list one and list two, things we're very familiar with. For list one, let's put in our actual observations. And for list two, let's put in our predicted, expected observations. So here's mine. My list one has my uh, actual observations and my list two has my predicted or expected observations. And then go to, go to your um, chi-square GOF test in your stats. Of course, we need to know how many degrees of freedom there are. How many degrees of freedom are there in this scenario, do you think? You can't use the old row minus one, column minus one trick because we only have row one row, so that doesn't work. So we gotta use the old trick. Make a guess, how many degrees of freedom do you think we have here? Uh, 
it is six. It's not 10. I'm curious where you got 10 from. Uh, it is six because there's seven data points. So n minus one, just like for the t-test, we had n minus one. For this one also, it's n minus one. I am curious where you got 10 then from. The I did um, what we learned today, the row minus one times column minus one. But, but, I think... but only one row. Right, I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so there's six degrees of freedom. So it should look like this, your chi-squared goodness of fit test. The observed is list one, the expected is list two, six degrees of freedom. Let's calculate what is my chi-squared value, which by the way, is still the same formula as it was before. So what do I get from my chi-squared value? Nineteen point twelve. My calculator doesn't have the GLF test. After the chi-squared test, my calculator has two sample F tests. Um. Well, Celeste, I don't know what to say. Uh, is it a TI eighty four? Mine's the same. Sorry. Mine's the same. It's the TI eighty three plus. The TI eighty three plus might just not have it. Um. It's it's. one of those things that is the difference between them. Uh, I, the good news is uh, I don't believe on the final, I don't believe on the final, there will be any need to actually use the goodness of fit test on your calculator, as opposed to uh, here are your, um, here's, here's the chi-squared and the p-value, what do you conclude type scenario versus actually you plugging it in. So again, how did I do that? Stats, put in your two lists. In stat, your first list should be your observed. Your second list should be your expected because I believe it's uniform. That's my null hypothesis. By the way, we should put that here. Hypothesis, it fits the model. It fits the model. Null hypothesis, it doesn't fit the model. Uh, stats, edit. That and edit. We've been doing this for a long time now. Putting data in, stat, edit, list one, list two. Yes, no, maybe so. So put in your data. If we have previous data, so if you have previous data, move your cursor up until it highlights L1 and hit clear. And then move it to L2 and hit clear again. Can I see what your input looks like for the GOF test before you press calculate? Sure. When I press calculate, mine says err. I wouldn't say err. Mismatch. Go back to your stat. Make sure that you have seven in the first column and seven in L1 and seven in L2 so that there's not a, a, you didn't miss a, you didn't miss something.
Did it fix it? Okay, that was the problem, hey? So where do, the, where do we go after inputting the numbers? Go to stat, test, and do the chi-squared goodness of fit test. Degrees of freedom is the number of boxes, number of cells minus one. So there are seven cells there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven days of the week, seven cells, you remove one, so there's six degrees of freedom. What's the p-value based upon your calculator's results? Point zero zero three nine six, or three nine seven actually. If I want to be more precise, doesn't change, uh, um, you know, my conclusion. And what is my conclusion, by the way? We reject the null hypothesis. Apparently, the data does not fit the model that it should be the same every day of the week. In fact, are there any days that are significantly different than the other days? Are there any days that are like, wow, these days just don't go with the rest? When you look at your, <clears throat> your actual values, are there any days that don't go with the rest? Saturday and like Tuesday. Well, Tuesday's a little high, not too high. Saturday's a little low. Saturday is Saturday is a lot lower. Sunday's a little low. It seems like I mean we can actually calculate the average. The average is a hundred, so seventy-two seems kind of low compared to a hundred. Tuesday's a little high, Sunday's a little low. <clears throat> Saturday and Sunday seem lower than the rest. Maybe Tuesday a little higher. Why we reject the null? It's less than the P, uh, the, because the p-value is smaller than alpha. The p-value is less than, less than a half of a percent. If we normally do 5% without any specific value of alpha, then we certainly rejected a half of a percent. Remember, we always reject p-values for low alphas. For, we always reject the null for low p-values. So can anyone give me a reason why you think, there's not a statistical reason, but just like a just like living life reason, why you might think that Saturdays and Sundays have fewer births than the rest of the week? Maybe like the doctors don't want to work then. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Now, doctors not wanting to work, doctors want their weekends, great. But if births are just, births come when births come, then what's that got to do with doctors, right? If, if the birth just comes when the birth comes, then, yeah, Luis, whenever the p-value is less than 5%, this is the same for t-test, for z-test, for every single test that we've ever done, if the p-value is less than the level of significance, usually 5%, we reject the null hypothesis. If it's not, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. And that is for every test. These tests are, are no exception. So again, I ask again, if, um, I mean, births come when births come. So doctors, you know, not wanting to. Uh... <laughs> I was supposed to be born on July 4th. The doctor wanted the day off, so I was born the third. So, Cynthia, can you tell me exactly how the doctor wanted the day off managed to change the day that your mother gave birth to you? Oh, because I was a C-section. And there it is. There it is. Some births are, in fact, scheduled, either through C-sections or for inducements of one kind or another. I don't exactly know all the details, but apparently uh, you can actually schedule births. Not all of them, of course. 
but you can schedule some. And as such, uh, the belief that it's uniformly distributed via the day of the week is uh, the, the, the data does not fit that. The data does not fit that. At a half of a p value of less than half of a percent, it does not fit the data. So we reject no hypothesis. So sometimes they cause contractions. Yes, that's so. Uh, that's that's inducements, correct? That's when when they say that they induce birth, that they're called. That's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen. We have finished the curriculum for Math 140 SCI. We are done. We are all finished. We are finito. Gornished. We're all done. It's a little Yiddish. Can impress people at parties and stuff. So on Thursday, why such an easy chapter is the last one? Maybe because this way you have the least amount of time to need to study it before the final. Right? Sometimes if you end on the hardest chapter and the final's a week later, it's like, oh my God, I don't have this, but and then an easy one. And now we can ask on it. Do you know what might be on the exam? Possible chapters you might focus on? I sure do. Everything we covered. <laughs> if we covered it, consider it. A possibility to be on the exam. Open notes, open notes, open notes. You know what? I'll tell you in a second. Hold on. Multiple choice. I can tell you about that. Most of it will be multiple choice. I actually have it right here. Uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, hi, everyone. Attached to the draft of the final exam. Let's take a look. Okay, show us a question. You want to ask a question? Okay, the first one is, what is your name? That is your. That is the first one. Let's see. Yes. Tables and formulas are provided on the last page of the exam. No cell phones or other communication devices may be turned on or incited at any time in the exam. If your phone is seen during the exam, your exam will be collected. You will receive an F and quite possibly for the course. Yeah, so don't do that. Okay, I have 25 multiple choice questions. And then I have four uh, longer questions. Yeah, so that's the question. Is it open notes? I got to ask him. I'm going to ask him right now. Um, I will look this over tonight. Meanwhile, I forgot what we decided about notes. Is it just the formula sheet at the end or are notes allowed? Okay, I'm gonna ask him this and he will respond. Thank you in advance, okay. Okay, I just asked him. Total of 29 questions. Yes, total 29 questions. It is five, 25 multiple choice, 125 points total, five points each, and 75 points. I believe it is Scantron, by the way. Let me see, at least for the multiple choice part. Um, do I have anything else from him? I don't think so. Oh, wait, this is Math 140 Science, right? I'm sorry. I take everything I just said back. I was looking at Math 140 Business. I was looking at the wrong thing. My apologies. Everything I just said, ignore. Everything I just said, ignore. Ignore, ignore, ignore. Um, so take it back, everything I just said. Uh, I'm looking for
The final exam will consist of multiple choice problems only. Only. Um, and do we, we still have the long questions at the end? No, multiple choice only. Okay. So how many would that be? Like how many questions? That I don't have here. Um, that I don't have. I'll take a look here. <laughs> the common final exam will be on campus as originally planned by the central administration. The final exam will be held on Saturday, December 18th from 10, 15 to 12. Okay, you know that. Uh, it'll be multiple choice questions. Students must write their answers on both on their exam copy as well as the Scantron. It's for, okay, Scantron, it is Scantron. And I'm gonna post the type of Scantron right here. It is Scantron form. Test 882E. The department will not provide scantrons or pencils, so students must bring their owns. Their owns. Okay. Okay. Um, a supplementary document will be attached with the final exam. It includes a formula sheet, tables, instructions for the TI 84 plus. It is attached again here. Every student must bring a calculator that manipulates simple operations and computes the square root of a number, but a TI-84 plus is actually not required, which means anything that requires a TI-84 plus, you will not be responsible for doing any of those calculations on the exam itself. So the multiple choice questions will be done in such a way as to not actually require you to do anything on a calculator, anything on the TI-84. Um, uh, during the final exam, every student must bring his ID. Um, two different versions to stop cheating. Um, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can still take your TID four. I don't. I don't leave home without it. <clears throat> um. So the Scantron. That's the the form test eight eight two. We that's your to, that's your Scantron. We have to bring that in ourselves. Yeah, it, it costs like a dollar or something like that. Or you get it online and you print it? I think you get it at the bookstore. You just go to the bookstore on campus and, and ask for that. The books, any, not the bookstore, but the, 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 the shops on campus, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the, the little stores, they all, they all sell. The one across from the bookstore, there's a little, uh, you know, the food court next to mm -hmm. the food court, that little store. I used to get all my Scantrons there. So, so they'll, okay. they'll have them. And I'm looking at this formula sheet. It's got lots of lots of formulas, lots of tables, lots of data. Um, all all the things you need. Yeah. So no notes. This is this is going to be it. I will actually I will actually email you guys a copy of this, so that you know uh, uh, what will be on it, so that you can see what you need to know yourself versus what's going to be on it. Um, yeah. Just give me a couple of days on that. And I know on, I know I got an email from someone about a, um, a practice final. And I have one of those two, I think, which I will be posting as well and getting to everyone. It might be my other math 140 course. No notes. The notes will be what, what we give you. Those will be the notes. Um, so I'll be going through all of these emails that I have and making sure that everything is everything that you guys need or can use or can study from or any information that you guys have, which will simplify what you need to do on your ends. Uh, it's already on Achieve. Okay, that could be, I can't log on to Achieve right now. I'm still waiting for them to send me my password, but as soon as I can log on, I will certainly do so. I just don't know. I don't know how to, I'll figure it out. Um, yeah, other than that, um, Thursday will be a review day. Now, I can't review the entire course in one day. So uh, you come in on Thursday and you say, uh, can you go over this topic? I don't understand this topic. Can you answer this question? Can you explain this? And I'll be more than happy to answer all your questions, but I'm just not gonna say, okay, on day one, we started here and just review everything. 
it's 15 weeks of material in, in a day, so it's not gonna happen. Is attendance required on Thursday? Um, yes. My first instinct is to say no, it's only review day, but then no one's gonna come even if you need the review. So if I if I give you the out, you're gonna take it. So yes, Thursday is a is a is a day as well. I didn't take attendance because I can't get on Canvas. Let me check one more time now, see if maybe they updated it and fixed it. Oh, I think they might have because it went pretty quickly to this screen. Hold on. Yep, I'm back on Canvas. So let's do attendance right now. Um, professor, I have a question. Yeah. Someone um, keeps asking in the chat, uh, will our grades be updated like before the exam so we can see what our grade is? And then we'll um, probably, probably, because that way um, I can grade your exam and then input your scores immediately. It all depends on, on whether I have time um, to, to collate them. So I'm not promising, but I would say probably. Uh, Adriana. Here. Joseph Ailman. Here. Christopher. Here. PC Val. Here. Idan. No, Idan. Michael Arrington's here. Airely. No, Airely. Andy. No, Andy. Mariah's here. Uh, Tanya. Here. Hannah's here. Monica. Here. Flowers here. Annette's here. Alondra. No, Alondra. Roberto. No, Roberto. Jason. No, Jason. Kaylee. Here. Drew. No, Drew. Luis Govia. No, Luis Govia. Leanne's here. Stephanie, you're here. Yeah. Sandra. No, Sanjan. Labeth. Here. Joseph Kim. No, Joseph. Marleni. Here. Cynthia's here. Angelica. Here. Maria Cruz. I'm here. Sana. No, Sana. Roni's here. Lila. No, Lila. Alexis. No, Alexis. Jason's here. Diana. Here. Sheila. No, Sheila. Mary's here. Celine. Here. Nikki's here. Estrella. No, Estrella. Luis Vega's here. Celeste is here. Crystal. Here. Okay, and that takes care of that. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, I'm gonna stop for the day. So.